In this video, you'll discover how a superabundance of people with severe alcohol use disorder has stopped drinking with almost effortless ease after rewiring their brains by following the Sinclair method to the T. I've known how the Sinclair method works for a long time. However, after watching the newest presentation by John Umhau, MD, about this method of eliminating alcoholism, I learned some life-changing new information that I wanted to share with you, my friend. Thus, you're about to become an expert on this topic, and for most people, as long as they do this method to the T, it is proven in studies to reduce alcohol craving and consumption significantly. Okay, here are the key concepts that we're about to dive deep into today. How naltrexone works against alcohol use disorder, the two methods of using naltrexone for alcohol use disorder, David Sinclair's research and how he invented the Sinclair method, how the Sinclair method works to rewire your brain to not desire alcohol, what the studies show on the Sinclair method for alcohol use disorder reduction, how to use the Sinclair method to the T to eliminate alcoholism, the possible benefits of the Sinclair method, the possible harms of the Sinclair method, why does the Sinclair method fail, Dr. Bruce Alexander's Rat Park experiment, and last but certainly not least, we'll cover a meta-analysis on Alcoholics Anonymous efficacy for alcohol abstinence, plus why there may be a contraindication with using naltrexone in this specific way at AA. So, I hope you're ready to go on an exciting and potentially life-changing exploration with me. Oh, and some of you will be happy to know that my bird, Papaya, was not in the room while I recorded. LOL. Okay, my friend, first, let's talk about naltrexone. Dr. John Umhau says, quote, Naltrexone blocks the euphoric effect, or the buzz, from alcohol caused by opiates. Alcohol use disorder is driven by this euphoric effect, particularly in people with a genetic predisposition. It's not an opioid. You cannot get addicted to it. It's highly specific for the opiate receptor, and that makes it safe." End quote. As with all drugs, there are side effects to consider. Naltrexone's common side effects may include headaches, nausea, anxiety, dizziness, and depression. Over time, some individuals may start feeling disenchanted with life, or a blah feeling. It's understandable that taking the medication daily for a prolonged period can lead to exhaustion and a decision to stop. Unfortunately, this often results in a return to drinking for many people. The typical dose is one 50 mg pill. Dr. Umhau says, you can also start with smaller doses and work your way up. That is particularly important for heavy drinkers. You want to start small and work your way up, and you'll have fewer side effects." End quote. According to the FDA label, utilizing naltrexone once a day can encourage abstinence. Nonetheless, it's important to consider that solely adhering to this FDA-approved protocol may not always guarantee sufficiently high and consistent blood levels of naltrexone for optimal effectiveness. It's crucial to strive for higher blood levels to enhance the likelihood of experiencing the desirable effects. Dr. Umhau also sheds light on another potential issue with the FDA-approved way of using naltrexone to promote abstinence. Quote, What's also interesting is you can imagine that if you have a drug that you're using day in and day out, it's going to affect the brain. And what happens is the opioid receptors become dulled by this blockade. When the naltrexone is removed, the receptors are looking for more stimulation. They have become oversensitized. And so, when someone drinks after prolonged use of naltrexone, that alcoholic drink can be even more rewarding than usual and will create a lot more desire to drink and a really severe relapse." End quote. Naltrexone is also available in an injectable version called Vivitrol, which can be very beneficial sometimes. Vivitrol is also used for opiate addiction as a way to block the effect of opioids and thus prevent relapse and overdose. When using it for alcohol use disorder, Dr. Umhau says, quote, After about three weeks, you may need to start using supplemental pills to make sure the blood level is high enough. Again, different people have different blood levels, making it essential to pay attention. But for the right people, alcohol use disorder can be remarkably affected by naltrexone. 
One patient wrote, they feel like they've been released from prison once they get this in their body. For some people, it can be a life-changing experience. No longer do they feel guilty about craving alcohol because they realize it's some chemical thing in their brain and they're able to move on." End quote. Let's merge our understanding of naltrexone with David Sinclair's research on lab rats. He pioneered the Sinclair method, beginning with the animals trained to consume alcohol. Sinclair's groundbreaking research revealed that animals exposed to alcohol for extended periods exhibited an increased craving for it when deprived of access, as indicated by their heightened lever-pressing behavior. Furthermore, he discovered that alcohol abstinence led to an upregulation of endorphin receptors, fueling excessive drinking. Known as the alcohol deprivation effect, this phenomenon offers a practical explanation for binge drinking. Following this revelation, Sinclair sought to block these endorphin receptors with naltrexone to observe the results. Remarkably, the rats lost interest in pressing the lever, effectively extinguishing their drinking behavior when alcohol was consistently preceded by naltrexone. This finding holds implications for understanding and potentially addressing addictive behavior. He hypothesized that using naltrexone before drinking could rewire the brain and eliminate alcoholism. Sinclair's experiment showed that people who religiously took naltrexone before drinking lost interest in alcohol after 3 to 12 months. Some people initially wanted to drink less, but eventually they completely lost interest in drinking altogether. Sinclair's groundbreaking insight revealed that by abstaining from alcohol and not using naltrexone on certain days, our bodies naturally upregulate opioid receptors. To aid this process, engaging in enjoyable activities that boost endorphins can be a game changer. These alcohol-free days present a perfect opportunity to reinforce non-alcohol related pleasurable activities, effectively replacing the urge to drink. Sinclair coined this transformative process pharmacological extinction, drawing inspiration from the behavioral changes seen in lab rats. Check out this slide showing two ways of using naltrexone. Basically what I want to show you is that these two methods have really different effects. So in the first way, patients were treated with dignity. They were told to just cope when it came to drinking. The doctors and counselors knew that the patients had a strong urge to drink. If they slipped up and gave into their cravings, they were told to keep at it, keep taking the medicine, try to drink less and do the best you can. We get that it's tough. In that group, you can see that naltrexone had a pretty amazing effect in cutting down the amount of heavy drinking. It's worth noting that these are placebo-controlled studies. In the second group, the patients were told to take naltrexone daily and you must be abstinent. You have to stop drinking. In that case, the naltrexone patients did worse than the placebo. Here's what Dr. Umhau says about it. Quote, Okay, so what we tell our patients is critical. We must be compassionate. We must understand this is a brain disorder. We must understand how the naltrexone works. It works on the endorphins that are produced by alcohol consumption. And it also works on the thoughts that are produced when someone thinks about drinking. So that's why naltrexone can work not only when people drink, but when they're just thinking about drinking." End quote. Now, let's connect Sinclair's insights with the pharmacokinetics of naltrexone. This graph vividly illustrates the pharmacokinetics of naltrexone. Following the intake of naltrexone, blood levels peak after an hour, triggering its maximum impact on the brain, effectively blocking the effects of alcohol when consumed. At time zero, it's not going to work, but just an hour later, having a drink will trigger naltrexone to block the alcohol's effects, reducing the urge to drink. This protection can last for around four to eight hours, influenced by genetics. When taking a pill before drinking, it can effectively block the production of endorphins caused by alcohol, resulting in a decreased interest in drinking. Repeated use can lead to a significant reduction in the reinforcement of drinking, empowering individuals to choose abstinence or to take the pill prior to drinking in order to prevent binging and excessive alcohol consumption. In Sinclair's research, it became evident that patients who adhered to the prescribed medication and therapy 
experienced a progressive reduction in their alcohol cravings over time. Though the decrease was not immediate, it was rapid initially and continued to diminish significantly as time went on. This highlights the substantial long-term benefits of the treatment. This graph may seem complex at first, but it's crucial to understand. The purple color represents drinking, while the red arrows indicate when naltrexone is taken. In the initial case, individuals drink, undergo detox, and are instructed to take naltrexone daily. However, it's evident that without consistent naltrexone usage, relapses occur. Understanding the importance of adherence to naltrexone treatment is key to preventing relapse. In the second approach, endorsed by Sinclair, individuals commence taking naltrexone while still consuming alcohol. This effectively diminishes the pleasure derived from drinking, leading to a gradual reduction in alcohol intake over time. With each drink, they take a pill, resulting in a noticeable decrease in consumption and eventually a waning interest in drinking altogether. This approach undeniably represents a significant step towards reducing the impact of alcohol use disorder. It really helps when people take an interest in their own treatment. One of Dr. Umhau's colleagues says, quote, people need to pay for their treatment, track their drinks and take the pill, and that's what works, end quote. This insightful graph demonstrates the power of progress tracking. Created by the C3 Foundation's innovative app, spearheaded by Claudia Christian, it sheds light on the Sinclair Method's efficacy in curbing alcohol consumption. The Sinclair Method, also called the targeted use of naltrexone, is backed by robust data. References to substantiate these findings will be featured in some of Dr. Umhau's slides. But let me show you something truly remarkable. This patient had been guzzling the equivalent of two bottles of wine every single night. Yet, within the first week of treatment, they managed to slash their intake to less than a bottle a night. The journey had its ups and downs, and after two months, they found themselves consuming more alcohol than ever before. But here's the incredible part. With the right support and guidance, this patient persevered. They persisted with their medication, and just a few weeks later, they reduced their consumption to one bottle a night. Then, unbelievably, a month later, they reached zero. This is a story of resilience, determination, and victory. It's fascinating to note that for some individuals, there is a gradual decrease in their alcohol consumption over time, while others may experience fluctuations. Nonetheless, it's remarkable to see that those who remain consistent with their medication eventually stop drinking altogether, as demonstrated over a period of 52 weeks. This represents a powerful pathway to recovery. It's also important to recognize that each person's journey is unique. Discover the potential benefits of the Sinclair Method. By using this method, you can achieve a lasting reduction in alcohol cravings, making it an appealing choice for individuals who prefer not to commit to complete abstinence. This approach allows for continued engagement in daily activities while receiving treatment, potentially decreasing the need for costly inpatient detox programs. Moreover, by taking the medication only as needed, you may experience fewer side effects compared to daily use, making it both effective and economical. It's important to consider the possible harms. Some individuals may be struggling with severe alcohol addiction and may not be able to benefit from certain treatments. It can be important to provide them with the necessary social support and personal growth opportunities that the 12-step groups and other resources offer. Now, Trexone may inadvertently give them a false sense of confidence making them feel like they don't need to make significant lifestyle changes. Furthermore, non-compliance could lead to increased alcohol consumption, which can be concerning. Why does naltrexone fail? Naltrexone may not work due to genetic factors. Additionally, fast drinking or consuming concentrated spirits like whiskey can override the effects of naltrexone. Lack of a comprehensive recovery program, excessive pressure, Boredom and psychological stress and suffering can also interfere with naltrexone's effectiveness. Dr. Umhaus says, And I have many patients who, sadly, even though they completely abstained from alcohol for a year or more because the naltrexone worked and they reduced their desire to drink, you know, something bad happens. And they say, Oh, I must be cured by now. And I'm not going to a group. I'm fine. I don't have a problem. They start drinking again. 
and the second time around, it seems like the naltrexone might be harder to get going and might not work as well." End quote. In the eye-opening rat park study conducted by Dr. Bruce Alexander, it was discovered that rats previously addicted to opioids demonstrated significantly reduced addiction when provided with the opportunity to socialize and play with other rats. This powerful evidence suggests that social interaction could be a key factor in overcoming addiction. Here are all the known activities that can naturally boost endorphin levels. Dr. Umhouse strongly encourages his patients to engage in these activities as a healthier way to replace the endorphin rush previously obtained from alcohol. The information presented in this slide suggests that 12-step groups play a crucial role in aiding some individuals in their recovery from alcohol addiction. A comprehensive analysis of 27 studies indicates that only one study identified an alternative approach as more effective than Alcoholics Anonymous. While these programs do yield positive outcomes for many people, it's worth noting that the Sinclair method may not be allowed at AA. For example, I had a private coaching client who told me his AA group kicked him out for being on naltrexone. And Dr. Umhau has had patients tell him the same. I don't understand why using the Sinclair method with AA would be problematic. Many of the transformations I've seen have been of people combining the Sinclair method with the Fit Recovery 2.0 method, such as Jolene and John, to name just a couple off the top of my mind. Well, that concludes your presentation on this fascinating treatment for alcohol recovery. I hope you enjoyed it even half as much as I enjoyed creating it. I want to thank John Umhau, MD, and the Alliance for Addiction Solutions for having him present this crucial information at their event for professional members such as Chris Scott and me. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you're not in our Fit Recovery tribe yet and want to be. It's free and fabulous, I tell ya. And make sure to visit our website, fitrecovery.com to get your free copy of Drinking Sucks, Dominate Alcohol, Get Fit, Be Happy by Chris Scott, the founder of Fit Recovery and creator of Total Alcohol Recovery 2.0. I'm Matt Finch and I hope to see you in the next video. Take good care of yourself and I'll see you next time. Peace.